If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> 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 Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. That doesn't mean that the Lakota, who were non hierarchical and matriarchal, didn't have times when they were hierarchical. For example, during a buffalo hunt, they named somebody to be in charge. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. We are going to be chatting with Four Arrows and Darsha Narvez uh, about the... N- Narvaez. Narvaez. It look, is it Narvaez, though? I think it's Narvaez. <laughs> <laughs> about the pronunciation the... says I, like E-Y-E-S. I, oh, yeah. well, I don't have the pronunciation. <laughs> about the Indigenous Kinship Worldview, it's a great show. Um, even though the name's a little hard to pronounce, it's a great show. And we get like a little surprise guest that comes in and gives us his thoughts. He's been going through some of the training for a little while and it's a fantastic conversation. Yeah. We get into initiation. Like this comes up a lot in the show with listeners too. We get into initiation for, for boys and what's missing and sort of raising kids. And yeah, we talk about your, you know, how you sort of seem to raise your kids in a, in a, maybe an unconscious indigenous way, but yeah, you seem to be naturally doing some of this. Some of it comes naturally to me, I guess. Well, that's kind of yeah. how I was raised. So, you know, I'm just sort of doing the same thing. And I wasn't raised by indigenous. I was raised by my mom, but you know, she was pretty keen to just let us run around where we were, where we came up. It was pretty like, we were pretty self-sufficient at an well, extremely yeah, young feeling, age. I have a feeling that those Northern communities were very much like indigenous in a way they probably got that way because of that right because of the influence oh yeah like by the time i was madison's age i was already like taking out boats by myself and i i had for my 11th birthday i got a snow machine you know not a super nice expensive one it was an old piece of shit uh that my stepdad had tracked down for me and got for a couple hundred bucks, but it was still mine. And I was like 11 and able to boot wherever the fuck I wanted all over the bush, sometimes hours and hours away. I remember like going and climbing up these crazy cliffs on the side of the lake when I was like 12, that if I see my kids on, I would probably freak out a little bit, but uh, you know, I probably won't be there when they're doing that kind of stuff. Let's be honest. My mom would have fucking freaked if she would have seen that stuff too. My mom's actually upstairs right now. Yeah, I mean, I think we're the last, or you're the last sort of, of the free generation. I heard somebody, I heard somebody saying that, like, we're, it's coming down. We're like, you're the last freedom, last free generation, really free. I think it's going to get freer soon. I, you know who it was that said that? I think it was James Lindsay that was saying that. James Lindsay? We should have him on the show. I know, I tried. We, we got to get a hold of him. He said no. I no, can't no, get a hold of him. Yeah, he fun. probably gets yeah. a ton of. Yeah, a ton of stuff. Well, it could get freer yet, still, buddy. I think there's still hope. I'm holding out hope. That's good. So, how was your trip? Uh, it was good. I just went to Vancouver for a couple of days to visit my family, and yeah, it was it was great. Saw a cousin that I haven't seen in a long time, like you know, twenty right? years. Oh yeah, at least, yeah, at least. I mean, actually, I thought I went to visit her, but we couldn't actually figure it out. So I don't know what I was thinking. I might have had these false memories about going to see her or something. It was really trippy. Different cousin? No, I yeah, I thought we thought of that, but no, that wasn't it either. So yeah, it was good. Yeah. Well, it was your first flight in like three years? Yeah, it's a bit of a pain, dude. I don't know. I don't like getting the airport uh, super early and having to put masks on the plane. And uh, you know, I mean, hey, the good news is the people in the airport themselves was like fifty fifty masking, and so people are kind of over it. I think for the most part, and then they kind of go through security, have to put it on. Some people take them off and then everybody puts them on for the plane, which is okay. I don't mind that part, but I don't know. 
we had to wait on the tarmac an hour and a half in Abbotsford coming back. So like the, the trip on the way back was literally, I could have probably drove at least halfway, halfway home by the time it took me to wait and fly. I thought it was super efficient in this little airport. I'm like, Oh, this is the way to go in Abbotsford. And then they, the plane gets stuck on the tarmac for an hour and a half. <laughs> I thought maybe we're not well, that happened in Calgary too. So it doesn't even I really know. matter. So yeah. it's yeah. like a total crap shoot. Yeah. Total crap shoot. Anyways, how was your, uh, how was your uh, experience there? You have a trip report for us? Well, I guess we get into that. Let's get into that. We got, we other, get, I got other we stuff get too. into that. Um, Friday or so that, so well, Madison had a horse show that morning. So we had to get oh, up yeah. at four. I had to get up at four forty-five, And, uh, so I could, you know, do my morning routine before I have to wake the kids up at like five forty-five, so that we can leave by six, which we didn't quite hit that target. But we were close, and then it turned out that we showed up at like 6.45 because everyone said to be there for 7, and then it turns out that everyone else showed up like closer to 8 or 8.15. People were sort of trickling in, so I had to like sit around for a long time, which is okay. You know, the kids love it, especially Madison was riding in her competition, and she gets a real kick out of it, and she got a bunch of ribbons. So it was a fun morning, and then I went home and had a nap because I have not been sleeping well. I mean, this is now as probably – Three weeks, four weeks of like, not no sleep, definitely sleeping, but I just like, I'm usually a good sleeper. Like, you know, I sleep fucking flat out till about three in the morning. I go pee, then I sleep again, flat out till my alarm goes off at, you know, six or 10 to six or whatever. But the last like four weeks, and I th- I don't know if it has something to do with sugar or yeah, you know you think it does right somebody told I think well you I think they... someone told me that they thought sugar had a role because I quit putting sugar in my coffee, which amounts to a lot of sugar when you really like start looking at how much sugar I was drinking in a day just in my coffee. Um, but I'm, it's not like I quit quit sugar. Uh, I'm still like if you know I'm sure there's still some sugar in some of the sauces. Yeah, but that's still a detox. I think you're still detoxing from the refined sugar. Because I don't eat any crap. You know what I mean? I don't eat like cake or muffins or any candy or anything like that. So I'm not getting a ton of sugar, but I'm still eating fruit. So I eat quite yeah, a bit of fruit, different. but that's yeah, still think, different. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I think the refined sugar is different. Yeah. And then work's fucking crazy. You know, like work's busier than it's ever been. Um. Our stuff is busier than it's ever been in a lot of ways. So just busy. I can't keep up on the emails anymore. I, maybe that's adding me a stress. I've always taken, remember I used to bust your balls about not keeping up on email. When I look on your phone and there's like 20,000 fucking unopened emails, it triggers me. And now my email is constantly like 150, 120, and I'm just like chipping away at the one and then the Grand America one. So I don't know. Anyway, I haven't been sleeping great. So I needed this nap in the afternoon because I've been getting five, six hours a night for a long time and it fucking catches up to you, which is kind of the reason that I was going to do the mushrooms. And I gotta say it worked out. I slept like a fucking baby last night. I didn't even wake up at three in the morning, just boom, flat out from 9 PM to, I even like shut my alarm off and slept right to like 625 or 630 or something like that. So that was good. So anyway, I went to Brooks to my friend Jesse's. I won't say his last name here just in case. Uh, he owns a restaurant out in Brooks and he bought this fucking thing and opened it all up and remodeled it and did it all during COVID. And uh, he's not, he hadn't been living in Brooks and he's been out like on the West Coast for a long time. So I haven't seen him in a long time. But we grew up together, hometown, you know, high school oh. together, all that stuff. Oh, cool. So then he was back in Brooks, opened the restaurant. I haven't made it out there yet. So I headed out in the afternoon, went to his place for uh, some food. It was fantastic. Absolute top of the line. It's called Home Time uh, Texas Barbecue out in Brooks. So if you're out in Brooks, you're in Calgary, it's, I'd say it's worth a drive. Just drive to Home Time and hit it up. The food's fantastic. His wife is like a real dessert, uh, what do they call that kind of chef? Like a pastry chef. So she does like fancy, super fancy cakes and desserts and they have a coffee shop on the one side. And then like Texas barbecue, kind of like the stuff we had in Montana. Very similar to, to that kind of stuff. So it was good. So I had a bit of food and uh, then 
we decided that we were hoping to have five grams each, but we only had nine grams. So we had four and a half each. And so get this, I go there and I'm like, I'll get a nice Airbnb or something. It'll be great. Show up in Brooks, no Airbnbs. Like, okay, I'll get a nice hotel. Call, you know, two or three of the nice hotels in town. Every single one's booked out. So I call the Ramada and they're like, listen, I'm telling you, there's this Red Bull thing in town and all the hotels are gone. The only place in town that has rooms is a Telstar hotel. And my buddy, my buddy's got a couple young kids. So it's not like we can go in his basement or something. You know what I mean? We were like taking a shitload of psychedelics. So we need safe space. So we go to this Telstar hotel, which is, you know, probably the worst motel I've stayed at in 15 years. It's like, you know, $50 a night. There's people like hanging out out front. They've got a little makeshift table drinking beers and we're just like, holy fuck. But anyway, we go up there, sit at the shitty little table and eat the mushrooms. And I'm like, well, maybe they won't be that strong. But they So much for set and setting. Well, I'm with my buddy Jesse, so really I didn't give a fuck. You know, it'll be fine. Um, so, yeah, but they came on fast, bro. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And it was kind of early. I got to say, like, we ate these motherfuckers. It was maybe 730. And by 830, not even by 8, I was like, whoa, bro. I'm fucking feeling it. And he's like, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. So we're like, we'll go for a walk. You know, it's still kind of nice out. We'll go for a walk. So we go outside and it's still like bright out. And, you know, people are still everywhere. It's Saturday in Brooks and we're like, holy fuck, this is a bit too much. And it starts to rain a little bit. So we walk over to Jesse's so he can go get a jacket. And then like while he's in the house, I start getting really fucking high. Like... Whoa. And I was looking at these cedar trees in his yard and I thought they were a fake. So I'm like climbing inside them. I mean, if you would have like drove by me and seen me, I probably look like that typical hippie kissing a tree. I'm like crawled half inside this tree. And I'm like, dude, this is the highest I've ever been on mushrooms. Not quite at this point, but we leave his place and we're like, there's this cool field across the way which is kind of like just an abandoned lot, but it's got some trees in it and stuff like that. And it's cool looking. So we're like, we got to get the fuck off the street. So we start heading into this field and we're just getting fucking higher and higher and higher. And it's like, you know, it's like waving in. And when it waves in, it's like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. So we're just like walking through these trees and these grass. And we're like, I'm like, I can't, man. I can't, I can't keep walking. So he's like me either, man. So we just, we end up sitting in this grass and then we end up sort of just lying down and laughing and like, you know, kind of talking back and forth about different stuff, but not really making any sense and a lot of laughing, you know, and, uh, we lied there until it started raining And then we decided that we should head back to the hotel. And we're like, we didn't have our phones or anything with us. So we like had no real concept of time or how long it's been. We did find a cool old tree. And uh, that was pretty neat. But anyway, so we head back to the hotel. We get back to the hotel. It's it's 10 o'clock. I'm like, okay, so we're two hours in. So we should be like through the worst way we should be like well like more like a third i'd say you know it's usually by like five six hours you're trending down so like well we should be through the worst of it you know maybe another half hour or so of like ramping up and then it's gonna peak out and we'll be like we'll be good so by 10 30 we're like super fucked up and we've by this time we've taken all the towels out of the bathroom And we're like, Jesse's wrapped up in one on the floor. And I was wrapped up in one in the bed. And, you know, we just did that till around one in the morning. And, you know, like by like probably around midnight was when I was sort of phasing in and out enough to maybe like even look at my phone and stuff like that. But yeah, dude, it was fucking rough, man. I had my head wrapped up in that towel for hours, like just like whole Holy fuck. 
And then going back and forth to like, you know, the funnies and the laughing and the giddiness. But, you know, it got some, there was some darkness. Really? Was, like what? what do you well, mean? I don't know. I don't want to get too into, you know, the, that part of it, but it was just, it was all good. You know, it was probably like, it was, it wasn't bad darkness. It was just some things that needed to be faced, I guess. Right. But so I, this is like yourself looking at your own psyche kind of thing? Or well, yeah, mind? that's very much what it turns into. It's like, you know, the last, from from like 11 o'clock till 1230 for sure, there was not a lot of talking. We were both, you know, by and that. You're in the towel, you're just. By this point, we were each on, on like just one. Kinda... Dude, no, it's a towel thing, bro. Like, you need a towel when you're doing lots of psychedelics. What? You need a towel. I don't think I've you, ever no one's ever told you this. No, I don't think it's like from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Really? When you're hitchhiking around the galaxy, you need a towel. Well, really? that's because this dude is talking about tripping on fucking psychedelics. That's my take, anyway. Is that Douglas wow. Adam is talking never... about tripping out? But when, personally, and I'm not the only person to do this. When I'm doing a ton of mushrooms, or even when you smoke some DMT or some acid, you always kind of end up in that point where you want that fucking blanket. Or that towel. And uh, I do anyway. It's very nice to have something around. And if you were tripping out on mushrooms and I threw you a towel, you would not give that shit up for the rest of the night. I would kill a motherfucker for that towel when I'm tripping fucking hard because it's my security blanket. I don't know why. If it's my like lifeline to this. So there was about an hour and a half of really going through, you know, my thought processes and my stresses and all that sort of stuff. But and kind of um, just, it's very much like a thing on your own mortality, you know? And it had been like three years since I've done a deep dive. So my ego probably needed some check and, you know, there's a bunch of stuff. So it was rough. And, and ironically, I didn't get any sleep that night because Jesse went home around two. But, you know, you're still, I mean, by that point, you're not peaking, but you're still fucking got a bunch of mushrooms in your system. So I, I think I fell asleep probably around 3.30, got up around 7, came home, you know, did my, actually I didn't come home. I stopped at the, because you helped me find, you sent me the directions so that I could track down, because I got lost in a couple of fields, so that I could track down the, so I went to the. The Majorville. The Majorville. Wheel? Is, it a, is it a medicine wheel? Or? The medicine wheel, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's not a ton left of it. There's just a bunch of like giant well, pile a, of rocks. It's a up peak, now. yeah, the giant pile. Yeah, but it's sacred. And... It's got some four directions there too, I think. Yeah, it's... so I went there and did my little ceremony and brought a rock up there, threw it in the pile, then went out shooting yesterday and came home and slept good. And well, my head is clear. The, what my was head you is clear. At the, at the, it was windy. Medicine wheel. Did you like? Was it warm and windy still? Like, yeah, you, it was nice. It was warm and windy. Of, like, did you get any sense of reverence at all from that? Or well, I always get a sense of reverence from it. And considering I was like still sort of coming down off a bunch of, of a crazy psychedelic trip, it was like it seemed fitting. It seemed like yeah. the right thing to do. Well, guys, and I had a bunch of weed I wanted to like, you know, dump out there and stuff. So. Were you guys like sort of telepathically connected during the trip when you're in, in your own towels and stuff? Were you still? Well, yeah, of- dude, I'm telling you, there's not a lot of people that I can even do that with. It's hard to be on that much mushrooms with other people and not just by yourself in your room. But at the same time, when you're in a super dodgy hotel room, you're pretty glad your buddy's there because I don't give a fuck about Jesse. You know, I don't care if he sees me crying or laughing or what I say in front of him. I don't give a fuck. I've done enough like shit with that guy and enough psychedelics over the years that I just trust him implicitly. I don't feel yeah, weird yeah. around him, which is the main problem. You start feeling weird around people when you're tripping out. So I didn't have to worry about that. So that kind of brought the set and setting in, I yeah. guess. But great. it was great. I feel good. Better than I have in, a, in at least a year. Good. Wow, that's great. And I didn't freak out. Remember, I've been scared to do those mushrooms again since the DMT. Uh, I don't know if scared is, you think? Apprehensive. 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 Let's go with that. But I lived, and I'm stronger for it. It's right so on. intimidating looking at that pile of mushrooms, bro. <laughs> How much, you just give people an idea of what's five grams, is 4.5 grams is like. like 
Well, five hands, five grams is a heroic right? dose, right? Five no, no, grams what is, is it a like heroic physically dose. Physically, like a handful, right? Like if your palm, like put your palm yeah, it's out, like your you palm kind of full. Your palm, it's your whole right? fill your whole palm up with mushrooms, yeah. and they taste terrible. You just eat the shit out of them, yeah, and get the gut rot. Oof, dude, there was some times when I was trying to pee and it was like the toilet was like running away. It was just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and just like, oh my God. But it was good. All in all, it was good. I recommend it. But right on. I don't, uh, don't, probably not in a dodgy it, hotel. Yeah. I don't advocate it, but I recommend it. If you're ready. Yeah. Not just anyone can just eat that much mushrooms. Like, well, maybe they can. They can. You can, but be ready for some shit. Yeah. And there's no shutting it off. Yeah, exactly. That's the worst part. I mean, there's some times in there where you're like, okay, I've had enough. Nope. Keep going. So that was my trip. Right on. All in all, a positive experience. So last week I had a, uh, I was on the Union of the Unwanted with, um, McCullough and now I'm going to Peter McCullough. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm going to gap on the other, on the, on the other name. Um, not uh, Malone. No, no. We should have McCullough. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what's funny is I thought, Oh, I'll remember it right before I, uh, I texted you the, the name. Um, you texted me the name here. I'll find it. You'd start talking about it. Cause he was a, Oh, Fleming, Fleming. I got it. Fleming. So, cause he was a huge part of like when my family and I were going through all this, uh, together, this COVID stuff, like watching Fleming and McCullough too. They were, they were a big part of just helping us get through this really, to be honest with you. And Fleming started up this thing called 10 letters.org. Um, I'm going to put a link in the show notes here, but I mean, this is kind of what I've been talking about. So this is co- kind of COVID ish, but I think it's worth talking about because he, he was on the union that wanted there last Monday. Uh, we talked about this, but it's basically like a, a template for letters to send Americans to send to their attorney general. So it's like, this is the time to band together as Americans to stand up for our rights. So millions of people have been injured or killed by this virus. Why has nobody, and this is kind of what I've been bitching to you about, why has nobody asked those responsible to be held accountable? So this is not an argument about being vaxxed or unvaxxed. So it's not about that. This There would be no need for vaccine, ventilators, or lockdowns if they did not release an illegal gain-of-function bioweapon. That's kind of like what I've been saying. Where's this? Where's this accountability? This is about accountability for those who are responsible. So people ask, what can I do? How can I help? You can send a letter to your state's attorney general asking them to do their job and protect those that have sworn an oath to protect. Demand they convene a grand jury and bring criminal indictments against the perpetrators. So what is the purpose of a grand jury? While grand juries are sometimes described as performing accusatory and investigatory functions, the grand jury's principal function is to determine whether or not there's probable cause to believe that one or more persons committed a certain federal offense within the venue of the district court. So now is the time. All we ask is you fill out a simple form, which will bring build a letter respectfully requesting your state attorney general's attention to this matter. So the letter builder on this website will pre-address your letter to your state's AG. The automated system will also include a cover letter that you can personalize and a letter of indictment written by Richard M. Fleming. His name's right in there that lays out the case for the grand jury to be assembled. The letter of indictment includes links to evidence that show the listed individuals have broken the law. Simply print the completed letter and mail to your state attorney general. When you have done with this mailing of your letter, please ask 10 friends or family members to do the same. So it's kind of like a a, a a chain letter. Chain letter. Yeah. Yeah. Chain letter format. Share this campaign on social media, encouraging others to stand with you. One letter may not be heard, but tens of thousands will. May God bless uh, each of us in this endeavor. If God is with us, who can stand against us? May God bless America and may God bless you. So then there's a build my letter button. Get started. There's an indictment letter. There's evidence. So there's a, a, letter, a letter example here. And then there's a whole bunch of evidence that he's got listed here. All kinds of cardiology, 
physics, radiation oncology, hospital clinic. I mean, it's all kinds of like organizations and people listed here, 117 pages of it, uh, links and all this stuff on this website. So yeah, I just think it's important for, I don't think it'll work in Canada, but in the States we have most of, most of our listeners are American anyway. So if anybody kind of wants to know what they can do or they want to take action, this is a great way to do it. Totally. And we appreciate if you do, because you know, that's where we'll run away to. It's Canada gets too crazy. Yeah. America.ca slash support, guys. If you're getting some value from our little podcast here from the 570 episodes, whole back catalog's all there for free. Head over to Grimerica.ca slash support today. Sign up for a monthly, make a one-time donation. Whatever you can afford, we'd appreciate it. It all helps, even if it's just a dollar a month. It makes a difference. Sign up today, and uh, that'd be fantastic. We do have another podcast where we get crazy, GrimericaOutlaw.ca. <laughs> Where we talk about stuff they don't like us talking about here. We just did one on like George Floyd and uh, furries and shit like that with Miriam. Uh, so that's GrimericaOutlaw.ca if you want to check that out. We do have the audio audiobooks and all that stuff we're doing over on adultbrain.ca. We'll get you to all of those. And then, of course, there's events. We got a couple coming up with Randall Carlson right away. I talked to Randall today. I actually fell in a mud puddle while talking to Randall on the phone. Full out, slipped on a piece of wood, fell in a puddle, phone got wet, hung up on him. I had to call him back a while later after I got it dried out. But he didn't care. He was like, I, you know, he's like, you did kind of hang up abruptly. But I was like, well, we did sort of get through everything we talked to. I guess he just had to go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, that was fun. I forget where so I was going. So there's a couple. That. There's a couple spots left uh, for. Yeah, September there's like Scabine, there's right? three or four spots many. left for week one, and there's seven or eight spots left for week two. So if that's something you want to get into, head over to contact at the cabin dot com and sign up for that today. Brandon Powell's there for week one. Dave Matheson's there for week two. Graham's there the whole time. Uh, Russ is there the whole time. Ben from Uncharted X is there the whole time. Of course, Randall's there the whole time. Brad's there the whole time. I'm gonna go down for a long weekend in between so I can meet both groups and uh, meet everyone else too, you know, say hi to Brad and all those guys. And then in February, we've got the magic on the mountain, Mount Shasta, California, you know, Greg Carlwood's coming from the higher side chats, Owen Hunt, Brandon Powell again, Joe Roop. We got a bunch of camping, 22 acres to play with a couple of hikes on Shasta. It's going to be a fabulous event. Contact at the cabin.com. Sign up today. Get your ass on a trip. You can just get over the border with fake papers if you're Canadian. It's fine. We know some people who've been doing that. So, uh, what else we got to get into? Um, I got a quote. I got a couple quotes. It's the profound quote of the week. Can you guess it? It's the profound quote of the week. Can you guess the human who spoke it or wrote it down? Profound quote of the week. All right. Um, I got two for you here. Two? Same different, person? Uh, different, different? Different people. Oh, so I get two chances. Yeah. Okay. What man actually needs is not a tensionless state, but rather the striving and struggling for some goal worthy of him. Jordan Peterson. <laughs> yeah, close. Uh, Victor Frankel. Is that close? I don't know. I either. mean, I guess what I meant was that could be Jordan. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it gets down to having to use violence. Then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you, pull your beard, flick your face to make you fight. Because once they've got you violent, then they know how to handle you. The only thing they don't know how to handle is nonviolence and humor. And humor. Oh, shit. Let's go with... Uh, I don't know. I was going to say um, the guy whose books you were just reading, but I can't remember his name. 
Fade a oh, man no. guy. Which guy? Fade no, a man. No, no, not H.G. Wells. Not H.G. Wells. Okay. It's, a, a, it's a musician, a famous musician. Oh, a famous musician. Yeah. Or singer or, or like Bono? songwriter. Is musician, it Bono? Right? It better no. not be fucking no. Bono. No, it's not Bono. No Bono quotes on the show, no. bro. No. All right, let's have it. Uh, John Lennon. I'm not sure if we should be doing John Lennon quotes either. What? Didn't he turn out it's to a, be like a crazy white I don't know. Beater? It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a beautiful quote. I, I guess. Mean, Oh yeah, that's what I was reading something about his "all you need is love" quote, but then it turns out he was just a total piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I guess we'll leave it at that. We asked for support. We mentioned all the stuff. We do need some support, guys. You know, it's a dog days of summer. Grandamerica.ca slash support. Uh, also, some good vibes because hunting season starts in three days, and we're going hard for some bow hunting action. And then the duck season comes up, so it's gonna be fun. Looking forward to it. Hopefully, I'll have good luck. Hopefully, you guys can help with that. Anything else? That's it. All right, guys. Enjoy the chat with Darsha and Four Arrows. Darsha and Four Arrows, Arrows, welcome to Great America. Thanks for uh, joining us. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks so much. This will be exciting. It's such a, like you were saying before we started recording the show, this is a, there's growing interest in in this uh, issue, you know, colonialization, uh, indigenous rights, human rights. I mean, it's really, I think what's happened in the last couple of years has really kind of piqued people's interest and they're learning more about it. So looking forward to getting in, into your book. Uh, I listened to it on audio. I really liked the way you guys did it on audio. You kind of had it like a dialogue. Both of you were were narrating it along with another narrator. It was really good. And I guess it's probably worth just a quick, uh, a quick brief sort of background uh, from each of you on how how you kind of got got into this. You're, I mean, I know you've got you've got huge resumes, so we don't have to get into too many details, but just a bit of a bit of the gist of it. Maybe we can start with four arrows. Yeah, well, you know that 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 third person was my grandson. He was a, a child actor, uh, and uh, he's 22 years old. And man, he could just cold read like a son of a gun. I made like a hundred mistakes, and you know he didn't make any. So, uh, but uh, it was uh, it was quite a project. That, but the uh, we were excited about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What about your your background? For I was getting to, to up to this point. Well, you know, I, uh, I'm a made relative of the Oglala Lakota uh, and a sun dancer. Uh, I was dean of education at Oglala Lakota College. My background is Irish and Shilagi or Cherokee. But, you know, it really uh, wasn't until my near-death experience in Mexico with the La Ramari uh, Cimarron people uh, where I started to really, really get uh, my interest in indigeneity went and got my doctoral degree in uh, indigenous worldview. And then my first job was Dean of Education at Oglala Lakota College. And from there, uh, I realized, uh, and I've traveled around the world. We just got back from Colombia uh, with the Kogi Mamos. And uh, that, that there is this worldview that we, that we had for 99% of human history that allowed us to live in relative harmony, health, and happiness, that uh, that we have to re-embrace in a way that we'll describe when we talk today. It's not an either or, it's a more complementary uh, project. Definitely. Thanks. How about you, Darsha? 
Well, I've had a complicated life history. I uh, grew up in, in my first years in Puerto Rico, having a Puerto Rican father, but didn't realize at the time that I, that means you have indigenous blood in you, uh, you know, a whole mix of things, the conquistadors, and the, I also have a German-American mother. Um, so anyway, I have had multiple careers, and my seventh career was my PhD in moral development, and I realized after, after a few years of studying moral reasoning, which was the big thing to study in Western psychology, that there was something quite not right about that, that it's... Uh, you know, what, how you think is actually embodied. It's how your body reacts to things, and that influences how you think and reason. And, and I discovered then the neurobiology of moral development. I wrote a book, uh, well, put a, together a book proposal about that, and it was to go through, you know, how the neurobiological uh, early experiences shape us to react in certain ways throughout life. And, you know, you can heal from that, but it takes a lot of work. Uh, and the book, though, had a mind of its own, and it came and brought me to indigenous wisdom, that the, what we have to get back to if we're going to reach our full humanity, our full potential, is to restore the indigenous way of being on the earth. And, and uh, then I discovered uh, during while I was writing the book, Four Arrows, and uh, we've been collaborating ever since, and so mm-hmm. it's been quite exciting. Nice. So is that is that indigenous worldview, the sort of the sort of the greater spiritual view, um, not really accepted in psych mainstream psychology still? Oh, right. Of course. Mainstream psychology is built on the Western so-called enlightenment view that reason, you know, is what makes us uniquely human from distinguishes us from other animals. Uh, and cut, always tries to separate us from nature. <laughs> it's still rooted in those kinds of ideas and that you can put people in a laboratory setting and test them to find out what humans are really like, <laughs> which is a crazy idea because that's not the way we evolve to live in four walls and to react to information on a screen or on a piece of paper. So it's, it's really divorced from the embodied uh, cognitive science now is shifting to embodied um, understanding of who we are, uh, but psychology is still behind, uh, uh, so rooted in the Western philosophy, which has this kind of divorced, you know, uh, reasoning head uh, yeah. over heart and, and body. Yeah, Graham, I can give you two two examples of that if if you would like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, two examples of why. You know, psychology is one of, like Dorsha says, one of the most colonized of our disciplines. One of them is uh, what many of the developmental uh, psychology uh, theories are based on, and that's Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And and Abraham Maslow uh, did not say what he learned in his six weeks with the Blackfoot on their reservation in 1935 because he was sure that he would be rejected by the field of psychology. And then uh, a second one is uh, uh, Gregory Cahetti and I were considered to be the sort of the foremost indigenous scientist, uh, former uh, director of native studies at University of New Mexico. We uh, decided that we would write a book called um, indigenous wisdom and neuropsychology and neuroscience because everybody was gaga over you know neuro neuropsychology and neuroscience and we thought wow we'll show how the indigenous worldview precepts uh, like honesty and courage and and, and and are are supported in the science so we got uh 42 doctoral students uh, in neuroscience and neuropsychology to do state-of-the-art studies of the, that are out there on these these seven topics that we had. And then when we got them back, a neuroscientist out of South Korea, John Lee, and, and then Greg and I, we were the three authors, we were blown away that over half of them contradicted 
They said things like, no, no, there's no such thing as real generosity because we saw a little place in the brain that lit up when people were playing Monopoly and we asked them to give their money away. That was the same where selfishness is. And, oh, dishonesty is a survival mechanism. And so we changed the title of our book to Critical Neural Philosophy <laughs> and Indigenous Wisdom. And the Institute of Noetic Sciences did a big thing on it. And uh, But that, that kind of substantiates what Darsha was saying and, and and two, and two pretty fun examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. And and, and I want to. I would like to know more about your NDE too before we go too further further into it. And, and if that if something specific happened in there that really kind of got you back to this indigenous. Well, yeah, I mean it. It was really what what started it. Uh, the vision that came out of it. The, the uh, um, I was uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, Vietnam era. I had a chip on my shoulder, and I took tried to knock it off by doing uh, uh, adventure sports, uh, 100 mile endurance racing uh, on horseback, uh, mountain climbing, white water mostly. So we tried to ascend the Rio Uric in central Mexico that had never been done and was uncharted. And I had a uh, kind of disappeared into a tunnel where the entire river went. And um, long story short, um, you know, you can people can watch it on YouTube. It's called the Shaman's Message. But um, I had this. We had two experiences with a, a, an old a, a wild lion, uh, in a cave where we had to get out of the river, uh, and then also a, a man that was carrying a fawn, a, a, a Tarahumara man who was carrying a fawn. He had run down, and the cat and fawn became. Uh, letters that brought me to a vision about indigenous worldview and dominant worldview and how that was fundamental to what we needed to do. And so that was what caused me to quit my my profession uh, as a a sports psychologist, go back to school and get my my degree. Wow. Wow. Fascinating. Sorry, I interrupted you there, Darsha. Were you going to say something before? Oh, I was going to say that psychology is really about maintaining the status quo. So they're just trying to, you know, alleviate the symptoms of living in a very uh, devastating culture, a nihilistic, uh, death-promoting, trauma-inducing culture. Uh, and they it's been criticized by others, but that's clearly what we're trying to point out is that there's another way. I thought I just yeah. read recently that the Lakota Nation... Uh, Banished, banished um, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church from bringing people on or trying to push it on the reservation. Is that true? Well, you know, the missionaries. Uh, when I was on Pine Ridge, I mean, you know, most of the schools that were that were there were missionary schools. The same thing on the Navajo reservation. I've got a lot of students there, and uh, and it creates a tension. Um, uh, Robert Warrior has written about whether or not Christianity uh, uh, and uh, and indigeneity can coexist. Um, I've written about it uh, in, in, in my University of Texas book, Unlearning the Language of Conquest, and say, well, it can, but, and I have a whole long stuff about it, Warrior thinks it cannot, and more and more people are starting to recognize it. Now, with the Pope having traveled around the world recently, you know, giving an apology, um, there's a lot of conflict also in, well, yeah, but what does that mean, you know, and what about the doctrine of discovery? So it's a very complex subject. Uh, and uh, both indigenous people, the Lakota as well, are are divided internally uh, by it. Uh, when you're when you're put in a box and you're abused and you're brainwashed, you come out with with belief systems uh, that you hold on to, even if sort of your better judgment might say, "Well, wait a minute that that doesn't that doesn't that's what got us in trouble." So it's very complex. Did you did you look into or did you come did you research in that respect like kind of separate Christianity from the Catholic Church as well like because there seems to be a really big kind of difference between like the Catholic Church but also this sort of Christ consciousness New Age kind of spirituality that seems to fit more in with Indigenous spirituality. We actually have a chapter in our book by a Christian Indigenous man. And uh, and I think that that really kind of sets the stage for our answer to this is that, um, uh, you know, his his position challenges 
the fundamentalist portions of 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 any religious text, and and especially the the, the anthropocentrism. You know, uh, uh, Bill Moyer uh, did an interview of. Um, uh, 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 who the the great um, who I can't my, right now his name escapes me. Um, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, thank you, of Joseph Campbell, and Joseph Campbell told the origin stories of the of uh, a crow people, and then he cried. I I, I was there with Sam Keen uh, when he presented, and he he actually after he gave he had given a given this presentation on the origin story. And then you can see tears in his eyes and he shook his head. He says, compare that with Genesis, you know, mm-hmm. and he had made a point that, that, that the one story has created us in, into a, 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 a deficit based perspective, a sin based perspective compared to the story that was much more different and much more non-anthropocentric. And so there's been a lot of, of work on this concern and, and, and yet um, in, from an indigenous perspective, anybody's theory of the of the great mysterious thing should be honored, unless it, it's it, it's hurtful. So it's a very complex, right, right. very 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 complex. And I and uh, um, and so um, you know the the idea of of saying that if 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 the teachings of Jesus are what really resonate with you, and these teachings you you see how they they work in your heart then that's beautiful and the same thing with muslim and the same thing with with judaism the same thing with you know whatever it is right and so um because indigeneity is not a religion you know it, it is a spiritual understanding and a worldview that any and all religions do articulate somewhere and you just got to be able to go, well, where is it where it's articulating and where is it where it's in contradiction and why? And this is this complementary dialogue that you, bless your heart, are having with us so that people don't see this as this isn't a black and white either yeah. or. It's that the dominant worldview uninvestigated is killing us. Investigated in light of our original worldview, we can find ways to begin to move in the, the, the columns that uh, that we have in our 40 worldview precepts and the 28 that we have in the, in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which we'll get, I want to make sure we touch on that too. Cause I, I love that list of all the comparisons between the worldview and where we're at right now. That's, I think that's really important. Darsha, one thing I don't want to leave out for sure is like, I loved how you, you guys talked about the raising the kids and the difference between like sort of the indigenous way of raising kids, even just the initiation or the, the affection or the, uh, the, the tribe, um, letting, just letting them actually be. And Darren, Darren's, um, and he's from, uh, an Ashinaabe. Are you, what, what are uh, you again, Darren? Ojibwe. Ojibwe. What's the Anishinaabe part of the tribe? Well, that's just there? part of the five part nations. The, yeah. So, and Darren, like I see that I was reading your book and thinking, this is like, Darren is, I think even just automatically sort of raising his kids this way in a way, different way that I've seen other friends of mine raise kids. I don't have kids. So I, I'm seeing it from a, a point of view where, you know, I haven't had the experience myself, but I see the way Darren sort of involves his young kids in, de- uh, in decisions and asks them their opinion all the time and lets them decide all these things. And I'm like, and I don't even know if he realizes that he's sort of, following this path so yeah we uh in my lab study the what we call the evolved nest so that's our species way of raising the young that we evolved over millions of years and it's just in the last uh millennia especially the last hundreds of years especially in the last tens decades uh that we forgot the nest and and so we're have, we're facing all the the outcomes from that from uh, really traumatizing babies when they're so immature. They, they're they like fetuses of other animals till 18 months of age. And so they need to be treated like they're in the womb, needs met immediately so that the biochemistry of all the things that are growing is in the positive direction and not in the uh, kind of detrimental uh, biochemistry. And uh, so we, we study that and we can see that their long-term outcomes 
how the brain is shaped, how stress reactive you are, whether your vagus nerves works well, which innervates all the major systems of the body. All sorts of things are affected by how nurturing you are in those, especially first five years. And the younger, the more important. Yeah. What about, just, go ahead. I was just going to say, my 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 daughter Jessica is an unschooler. She runs a uh, a school in Los Angeles uh, uh, that you know it, 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 uh, unschooling. And it's interesting. She's got you know uh, one of my grandsons who read the the book. Um, he graduated from UC Berkeley when he was sixteen, and uh, the other student, uh, Kyan, is now on a full scholarship at Stanford at, at, at seventeen and halfway through it. Right. She, she has raised her children the way Darcy is saying and uh, we just uh, just got a chapter accepted for a book uh, on a fictional story involving two little children who find this mysterious letter to Earth's children that they seem to be responding to their recent complaints about their normal schooling and it just got got accepted and in it you know these children are saying how come we have to do this and why is this you know and and they found this letter that is from indigenous children that are answering it. So, um, you know, Darsh has been on to this as a as an academic. And and, uh, um, you know, I think it's it's you know, we have this. She calls it the top down and the bottom up is, is the bottom up is this crucial thing. But we've got a lot of people we've got to get to, who are going to be parents that have to learn it from the top down. Have have you seen a change, Darsha, in the last, say, 10, 15 years with people understanding this a little bit more and changing their parenting ways? Uh, well, we're still uh, working uphill or upstream, I think, because uh, at least in the United States, uh, parents are so unsupported. Um, I mean, it gets worse, it seems, every day uh, how hard it is to raise children in maybe the worst place in the world. Uh, the United States, right? Because there's so much stress and uh, lack of uh, extended neighborhood community support systems and parental leave, paid parental leave. The United States is one of the few countries in the world, maybe three that don't have it. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so you can't breastfeed really because you've got to go back to work in two or six weeks. Uh, and you can't be kind and, and attached to your child because, you know, you're going to have to break away. It's crazy stuff, right? So yeah. uh, we've undermined uh, the health of our of our nation by undermining baby care and young child care. And we're paying the price now. Yeah, even Brett, I noticed on your on your uh, I think there was a short video and on your evolved nest there, uh, I was uh, looking at. You mentioned about uh, breastfeeding as well and, and how important that is and and uh, how some other countries get it way better than, than the States. How's Canada in that respect? Uh, they're better. They have paid uh, leave for at least a while. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah, it's about- still not great. I mean, you need to be, if if someone's not making good money, then you're, you're in trouble. I mean, yeah. most of the people I know are not, or maybe... You know, they're the 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 mom can stay home for maybe nine months or a year, tops. But you know, most you know, it's probably ninety percent of the households I know are like dual working, yeah, um, setups. So you know, it's a actually that number seems to be going down though. I I seem to like a lot more stay at home moms than there was when I was uh, when I was you know, 15 years ago when I was the same age as some of the kids that are working for me. I think COVID has probably had a lot to do with that. It seems to have been like an attitude adjustment. It's like the labor force has changed. The people are still there, but something has changed or people have found something to do or they're, they've been home and they found a way to get by, but it's definitely changed something. Yeah. In the workforce for sure. Well, ideally, it would be the grandparents mostly caring for the young children because they they are a little more forgiving. They're more uh, tuned in. The parents age 20 to 40 or so are really oriented to working and and building their identity and figuring things out and getting things done in the world. So uh, ideally, we'd have extended families who are uh, living together or close nearby, right? I had my little uh, nine-year-old and my five-year-old come and live with me for about a, a month. And uh, my older grandchildren, uh, Kyan and Sage, they said, what did you do? They're, they're, they're doing 
meditation in the morning. They're running. They're washing the dishes. They're they're being respectful. They're having. They're doing. They're playing music, and and they they're just like. <laughs> so my daughter is coming down again with uh, with her son uh, uh, in five days for a, a, another ten day session with grandfather. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's just what what we've been talking about is it's giving them a sense of who they are, that they, that they are, um, they've, they've got the wisdom. They have uh, the, 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 all the things going for them and they have to be able to get out and do it and, and, and have the learned, learned to move into courage and from courage into trusting the universe with fearlessness, um, getting the sense of interconnectedness, uh, lots of stuff with, with animals, um, uh, the only time that I got um, that that uh, Rye got in trouble was uh, I, they had learned to make an omelet and they were in making an omelet. And, and there was something between the, the five year old and the nine year old. And he grabbed something, you know, kind of rudely. And she cried. And I said, well, what was that about? And, and, and you know, he kind of looked looked down. He felt he felt like he was going to get in trouble. And I said, well, you just stop what you're doing there and let her con- continue the work. And then I looked outside and I saw a huge um, uh, hermit crab. Really, I mean, it was this big around. And it was just walking right over the, the, the step outside my door. And I said, in fact, I want you to go sit down next to that hermit crab for as long as it takes. He probably would stop or whatever, follow him if he moves. And I want you to come and tell me three things that you, you've learned about thinking about what you did with your sister. And, and I was out in the ocean with uh, Corey when he came out about an hour later. And he came down and he just had these powerful, beautiful ideas about how he needed to take a breath when he felt that anger and, and, and kind of go into his shell. I mean, it was just fantastic, you know, learning. And, and, and you, when we because we live in nature here, we're all right on the ocean. And, um, you know, we, we got crocodiles and boa constrictors and lots of lots of animals here. And, so I think, and that, that's, it, it's not just me bringing up animals. It's key. It's the other than human perspective is probably the most foundational difference and the most difficult thing for us to really get on the dialogue table when people start talking, even about indigenous world. So wow, part that's of the, a great point, yeah. Part of the Evolve Nest uh, components, uh, we, we've identified nine of them is nature connection and immersion and relationship and the healing practices. And, and the Four Arrows is demonstrating a kind of healing practice, right? And then there's affection and self-directed free play and multiple adult caregivers and responsive relationships and a welcoming social environment, as well as breastfeeding and soothing perinatal experiences. So Four Arrows is doing the nesting. Uh, that those children need, and then they grow and blossom and flourish in those conditions. Yeah, that's amazing to hear that awareness from a from a young a kid. You know that just like going into that much depth. You know, and it really brings that connection. That na- that really brings us out of our just separateness to to the world and nature, and brings us to, to connected with it. What about older older on uh, initiation? We get we do get like listeners uh, talking about you know, they they kind of wonder like how they can initiate their kids or how like there's sort of a lack of this sort of initiation now in our Western world. And I love how you mentioned those examples in the book about um, how different it used to be, you know, letting these young kids go on their own in the woods for days and to kind of, you know, fig, you know, f- reach the, their spirit to animal or whatever, whatever it is. Do you want to mention a little bit about the difference between that and, and how we're so far away from that now? Well, the, there was a uh, a man that came to me about 25, 26 years ago and asked me if I would endorse his hunting book. And uh, I was, you know, I, I was not a fan of game hunting, of course. And uh, uh, I went, well, let me talk to me about it. And he said, well, he believes that the loss of initiations is the biggest problem facing the children in America. And that the way of hunting with bow and arrow that he uh, wanted to talk about in his book and how to track and how to do all these things, he felt it was 
one of the great initiations for 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 people, uh, especially young boys in America. And uh, based on what he, he had read of my work, he thought that they would go together. So I read his stuff, and I did endorse it. So it, so I think you're bringing up a very important topic. Who was it? Boy, I don't even remember his name. If that's how long ago it was. Um, <laughs> Wasn't really Steve like, Rinello, I, I wasn't Steve Rinello, was it? No, it wasn't. I, if you said the name, I would know it. I could go through some, but I don't. We, you know, I, there's no point doing that here. It doesn't really. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's no. not that important. But it is an important thing. I mean, uh, I mean, they, people nowadays would would cringe at the thought about letting your your young kids, you know. But we grew up in the '80s, like. We grew up in the 80s, or I did anyways. Darren's a little younger than me. And we were pretty I grew free up range. in the 80s. I was just well, younger. Well, yeah, yeah, you were younger. You know, we were pretty free range. And, and I just realized now, like, I, I don't have kids, of course, but I mean, every it seems like we're they're so, they're under such strict kind of like uh, daily routines and getting driven everywhere. And I mean, and that's not even like, you know, initiation or, or what we're talking about, true indigenous sort of freedom as a kid to go out in the woods on your own and and figure stuff out spiritually or metaphysically or whatever, but at least one of, the most powerful, one of the most powerful experiences I had as a seven-year-old was my dad wanted me to catch a rabbit for dinner and our rabbit trap. You know, I, he helped me fabricate a wooden rabbit trap where you walked in a door and there was a little, you know, the stick that moved and then the door would close and the rabbit would be alive inside this box. And so I heard this noise and, and uh, I ran out and said, dad, dad, you know, there, I think we got something. And sure enough, there was a rabbit inside it. So he brought it in and he said, all right, well, you have to kill it. And, and that was, you know, and clean it. But all I heard was kill it. And, you know, it was the most traumatic thing that I can remember. And, as a result of having done it, I remember having a leather glove on and having a, I had a, a leather mallet and I was hitting it on the head and it was, it, it was crying. And, and I, the process of, of killing this creature that was looking at me, uh, it, it, it put a, an idea of interconnectedness and sentience and empathy and on and on and on. And, and I've used that later, much later at the Idaho Youth Ranch when we, with our troubled kids. Um, but, but anyway, I don't want to, Darsha's got well, more to say about yeah. it. Do you have anything about that, Darsha? Uh, I, I have a terrible autobiographical memory, so uh, I don't remember those uh, early years too much. Um, but I think we have to uh, we have a lot of parents who are so anxious now because they were kind of under cared for, not nested. And, and then it builds an anxious uh, threat reactive brain. And then they want a helicopter or a lawnmower or even jackhammer their ch children's experiences. So there's a lot of adult healing that has to take place. We have to. What kind of initiations, Darsha, would, would you see as that, that someone could, you know, in a non traditional way uh, because they don't have access to that but what kinds of of, of, of initiations uh, that that people could do like like you know where the two come to the father is a Navajo uh, story about twins who have to go through these initiations to become uh, solar and lunar balanced and and one of them uh, that I did at the at the Idaho Youth Ranch when I was running it was um, they had to sing to a monster in order to, to be let pass instead of shooting it with an arrow because the lunar twin said, I don't think we should shoot it. His arms are too long. And, uh, and, and monster slayer who was the solar twin says, well, what do you mean? And, and, and the lunar twin said, well, I, I think we should sing to him. Well, unlike the twin hero stories in, 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 in our Western worldview, the solar twin kills the lunar twin, Romulus and Ramus, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Hercules and Iphicles. No, nobody even knows Iphicles, right? But in this case, no, they work together, the sun and the moon. So the boy sings. So we had at the Idaho Youth Ranch, we, had, we created a thing where people had to sing in a particular situation as one of their rites of passage to get to another place in, in the progression of, of, of this uh, residential treatment program. 
And singing scares the heck out of a lot of people, especially kids that have been done doing drive-by shootings. That's, you know, they're afraid to sing, right? But so there's so many different ways of, 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 of creating ceremony and honor by doing something that initiates you into another level of, of, your, of your growth. And I, and, I, and I think that's so important. Do you have any ideas on that, Darsha, at all? Uh, well, I, I only have done nudging kinds of things with my students. And we did a, a to, just to get to nature connection, just the first step, you know, a little a few inches into feeling uh, back in relationship. Uh, we did an experiment a few years ago where we had college students um, in, in the experimental group. They read a few things. I took a pretest, read a few things, and then they were they selected 21 out of 40 some activities and took them along. And each day uh, they would pull one out of an envelope and do that for the day. And then they came back uh, three weeks later and took a post test. And the kinds of things that the experimental group did was, uh, you know, pay attention to the clouds today. <laughs> As you're walking to, across campus, acknowledge each tree you meet. Things uh, to get them back in their bodies, to get them in their senses, to be aware of relationship. And there were effects. So it worked. Uh, they were more ecologically attached, ecologically empathic and mindful at the end of those three weeks. So those are little things. And, you know, I used to sit outside with my students or take them to a, a state park and, and give them four hours to run around on their own to find their nature connection, a sit spot for a while. John Young talks about all sorts of things you can do. We are using some of his exercises to get back into your animal senses, you know. So there's various things like that that parents can do every day or uh, their children can do. Um, but I think these uh, transitions, these vision quests, these kinds of uh, moving into adulthood, I think we really have to think about what, what can be done today uh, so that uh, that young people, uh, adolescents in particular, feel connected to the universe. They find their gift and they connect it to being part of the universe. So they don't feel like they're alienated or isolated or, you know, have to do something to get some attention. Yeah, that's a good point. A few point. grams of mushrooms ought to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might do it. <laughs> Do you, can we talk a little bit about your book, the restore? I mean, we have been, but I mean, more more detail about the, uh, especially that list of the the precepts. I think is what you called it, the restoring of the kinship worldview, um, the twenty eight precepts for rebalancing life on planet Earth. Um, can we talk about that? I really found that fascinating. Like those are kind of like really sort of bullet pointed, like you know, things that people could really grab a hold of. Yeah, we picked uh, 28 of the 40 that Four Arrows have been working on for some years, right? Four Arrows, you're muted. Um, and uh, we picked 28 based on our interests and based on what we could find, uh, quotes for from um, uh, that were reliable, I guess, and interesting. And then we talk about each of those quotes in the book. And to, you know, to give the, your, your listeners a, a sense of what we're talking about, we're, we're talking about ideas that, that many people will go, well, wait a minute, I think that makes sense. I'm on the indigenous side of that. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm on the indigenous side of this. But then we ask them in the preface to how to look at this. Is this how you're living your life? Are these the institutions? Are they representing this in your life? And then people go, oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know? And that's kind of what so let me just name some of them. So you've got rigid hierarchy. And uh, the first one I'll say is the dominant worldview manifestation. And the other one is the indigenous common worldview manifestation. And rigid hierarchy versus non-hierarchy is <laughs> a classic one in the scholarship, right? That doesn't mean that the Lakota, who were non-hierarchical and matriarchal, didn't have times when they were hierarchical. For example, during a buffalo hunt, they named somebody to be in charge. And that, and then that person, another person was named next time. But then that changed. So, But generally speaking, you could say, well, wait a minute, I'm not hi hierarchical. I don't have power 
well, wait a minute. Then you start thinking about what, how you treat your children. What do you do at work in a day? How are you treated at, at, in, by the government? And you realize, oh my gosh, I, this is manifested and I am not challenging it or trying to change it. Same thing with fear-based thoughts. Same thing with living without strong social purpose. Same thing with focusing on self and personal gain instead of community welfare. Same thing on rigid gender stereotypes instead of respect for fluidity. Materialistic versus non-materialistic. Earth is an unliving it as opposed to earth and all systems is living and loving. More head than heart. Competition to feel superior versus competition to develop positive potential. And I'm just on number nine, you know, so this is how they, they go. This dualistic thinking or um, ceremony as just formality or as life sustaining trance as dangerous or trance as a natural and essential way to, to live in our lives. Um, conflict uh, about uh, mitigated by revenge and punishment versus conflict resolution about a, as, as a return to community um, on and on and on it, it goes. And once we start looking at these things at, and as a dynamic that we can say, well, wait a minute. Okay. I, I have no, no experience with trance. Uh, I, I've been told it's dangerous. Uh, religions tell me uh, hypnosis is of the devil. I, I don't want but let me look at, at that and look at the other and, and start to play with this until I realize possibilities that I've been misguided and that there are ways to, to, to live in which I can use trance in a, in a nurturing, healthy, constructive way. And this dialogue is what Darsha and I do ourselves and we're encouraging others to do. That's great explanation. Thank you. So what do you, like a lot of people are, and we talked about this a little bit at the beginning before we started recording, but people are really, you know, they're getting more interested. They're waking up a little bit more to, you know, the, the impact, uh, you know, the enlightenment had actually and colonialization after that or during it. Um, what do you think the most important thing is that people need to know in that respect, like that they might not sort of realize what, you know, the Im impact. I mean, for me, I kind of go to like, this materialism versus sort of spirituality. Like that was kind of like, to me, that's the sort of the main sort of thing. That's kind of, <laughs> I would, I would say disconnection. That's uh, the Western uh, Westernization and colonization has been all about disconnecting, disconnecting people from their themselves, their hearts, their intuitions, their connections to nature, the rest of the natural world, their, connections to their mothers, to their families, their relationships, to the neighbors, uh, to the future, to future generations, to our ancestors, all that's disconnected and broken because the Western worldview is relationships really don't matter. It's about reasoning. <laughs> it's about control and domination, right? So uh, that's the biggest thing is reconnecting. And yeah. a lot of these precepts are about that. And, and the, you know, the people who are doing this addiction uh, study work where they think that that's the main reason for also addiction is the lack of connection. So that would really help in that respect, too. Right. So you need yeah. to feel like you matter. And that's where the evolved nest comes in, because that early life experience of nurture, you, you feel connected all the time. You're not pushed into sleeping alone, the, you know, the sleep train or being left to cry. That's all about disconnection. <laughs> You're disconnecting yeah. from your, you know, being warmly attached. Uh, so that's just a crazy way that we think is normal now to disconnect. Yeah. Uh, if I was really bold, and I, I would, I, we probably shouldn't do it. There are a lot of reasons, but I would yell upstairs to uh, Jurgen, who's a Colombian man in his 40s, who came to me, did his first vision quest, has has learned indigenous ways, and has really it's transformed his his life. I could call him down and ask him. What were the what were the things? And I'm sure he would he would tell you that one of them is that by on his vision quest, what happened with a pelican and what happened with fear of the ocean that and it looked like he was up on the, on an island and all these things that happened that connected him in a way that he lost his fearfulness. He recognized that he was part of so all the things that were that relate to this idea that Darsh is talking about. Uh, and, and, and it can't it has to be. Not just within the human 
framework be, and, and and we get you know we could talk about why that is uh it, it, and get philosophical about it but it what i found is with because i was i was doing clinical psychology and and sports psychology and until it got into participating with being equal to understanding not being afraid of having compassion for other than humans that began to do something about life and death and everything else. And, and so um, you talk about material uh, versus materialism versus spirituality, Graham, what, what part of that spirituality has been about other than humans for you? Uh, geez. Well, just more of an anim. It's sort of, it's sort of flu sort of blending into more of an animistic sort of point of view, you know, more of a, more of an all around, everything's alive, everything's connected kind of thing, you know. There you Everybody are. used to think that until a few hundred years ago. Yeah, exactly. It's common yeah. all over the world for our species, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. They did a good, a pretty good job of hammering it out. Yeah. Well, if you spend, uh, what, 12,000 hours inside four walls, is schooling <laughs> for from uh, six years old to, to 18, yeah, you start to lose your senses. <laughs> Darren, do you have any questions at all? Well, yeah, I got a bunch of questions. I guess uh, the first one I'll ask is is how how's it been going? I mean, you know, the last the last three or four years have been kind of big, um, you know, maybe even longer than that. You know, it might have been the, the last decade or two, but it definitely seems to be picking up steam. Um, in Canada, it's sort of unclear which way it's going to go, but the conversation's happening of maybe ending the Indian oh, Act and getting out of that somehow, what that's going to look like. Uh, what do you think? I mean, because obviously you're a little bit older, so you've been you've been around for a while. What do you think? Do you think this is something that we'll see start to start to at least come together? You know, in the next decade or so, or do you think we're still a couple generations away from sorting this out? I think the can Canada is much uh, more ahead. Uh, and perhaps Australia, even and New Zealand and uh, the United States. So maybe it's uh, hopeful in the next 10 years. But the U.S., there's so many obstacles. I don't know, four arrows, you probably have a more sophisticated idea. No, I, I think that uh, there's two parts to it. My answer to that question, the, the first is, if it's saying, do you think that there will be enough discussion about indigenous worldview to turn things around? I would have to honestly say, I don't think there's evidence for that. I think that there's no question of an increased interest in it. But if you look at the, what's happening in policy and in the real world and in, 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 in warfare and oil and, and money and conflict, uh, the, you know, a few people like us that are talking about this isn't going to be sufficient. So I don't think we have much of a, of a chance. Um, and uh, I, I said this the first time I said this uh, in public was to, uh, just before the pandemic uh, up at the University of British Columbia. And, and, and when someone says so, that's the same question that you did, Darren. And and I said, no, I don't think we can turn things around with with it. And then the next question was, well, why are you here? <laughs> why are you doing this? And uh, um, Darcy and I have talked about this before. And. Uh, you know, I use Sitting Bull as a representation of, of why, because when I study the life of Sitting Bull, I realized that he had no hope that he was going to be able to turn things around at all. It was obvious the more I read his interviews and, you know, smallpox had wiped just about everybody out and was wiping out more people. The Buffalo were all gone. He was being chased. And yet every day he was singing, writing songs, doing ceremonies, being generous, taking care of the children, helping people that were hurting, treating the enemy with generosity. I mean, he it was like the, the, the exclamation point of people that, that saw what he was doing and how he was doing. Was, Why? Why is he living life so completely? And in an interview, he said, because 
I'm a human being and this is what I'm supposed to do. And, and I'm a spirit inhabiting this body and it's going to continue. And so someone's going to rebuild. Now, I'm not saying don't, your readers don't get depressed on me. I'm not saying it's impossible that a hundred monkey effect could happen, you know, uh, and, and things could turn around. It is possible. But to me, I believe that this work, I believe will be there for us and those young people who are going to do the rebuilding. That's a great point. It's an intergenerational solution, really. Yeah. Darren, do you have another question on that? Follow -up? No, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's well answered. You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, he's supposed to be, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess uh, I, I do kind of have a, an abstract question a little bit, um, kind of in, in terms of what's going on right now and like and colonialism as a term, kind of, as a... Um, I mean, people are coming around to to the problem with it now more so than ever. I think because what's happened in the last couple of years too. But but how how do you discern a, older colonialism with sort of modern totalitarianism or almost digital colonialism in a way? Like, I mean, a lot of people are afraid that um, what's happened to the natives in Canada is happening to everybody right now. I mean, on a on a digital or on a global scale. So. Is the colonialism in the modern times more so like a class war than colonialism? Like, how do you how do you use that definite? How do you use that word as opposed to like making it about class and and the elite sort of wanting to control the population, regardless of whether it's indigenous or or not? I think the word hegemony, cultural and educational hegemony, probably really uh, d gets to that point that there's no question that educational and cultural hegemony is colonizing, uh, constantly continuing the status quo, continuing the oppression, continuing the concept of hierarchy, all of the things that are on the dominant worldview, telling us that uh, and getting us to believe in more subtle ways than at gunpoint that uh, what's coming down in education and in psychology is for the greater good, when in fact it's only for the ruling elite and their status quo. And so this idea of the academy, uh, higher education, uh, uh, ed uh, medicine, uh, there's none, none of the of the of the great disciplines, including entertainment, where you could not sit down with with an average person and say, in what way is this cultivating oppressive hierarchy, uh, uh, superiority, uh, uh, you know, benefits for the elite, and and and, and a lack of, uh, of of understanding the value of anything that is. Uh, not human, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and prejudice. I think it's it's stronger because of its subtlety. It's stronger in many ways. I mean, I'm not saying that if you watch, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, Exterminate the Brute uh, film, the four-part film, or if you, you, you watch King Leopold's Ghost and you see the horror of the physical this of, of of colonialism it's hard to say what i'm saying is is more difficult but if, but i think in many ways it is and, and there's probably more people suffering uh so i think it's it's a it's a it's 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 happening right now and and uh, and that we're not challenging it sufficiently in any of those any of those fields yeah that's kind of what i was getting at yeah and, and by the way okay are, are you going to be editing this right you can edit it if you wish this interview or not? We, we can if we wish. We don't usually. You yeah. don't usually because I, my my friend just came down. And I said, "Do you want to tell them what you learned from the yeah, indigenous?" Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, here we go. Down, yeah. We don't do the video anyway, so it's not it's not yeah. really that yeah. big of a deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of ways, it's like the the damage was done for the for the hundred or hundred and fifty years with the residential schools and I. I forget mm -hmm. exactly. I think there were boarding schools in the States and the banning, oh. the banning of the Sundance and all the other religious ceremonies, the potlatch, all that stuff. It it really seems like there's no putting it back in the bottle. I mean, in Canada, the, you know, half the languages are a generation away from being gone. 
You know, I'm lucky. I'm a an Ojibwe, so we've got like an online conversion. It'll be an option for me for the rest of my life if I want to learn it. It's it's on the internet now, so it ain't fucking going anywhere. But most of them are lost, and 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 the rest of the culture, most of it's gone. I mean, even even the elders we still have around. I mean, my chief is just a fucking bootlicker. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't give a fuck about the culture or about the the ways of the past all he gives about is licking that government boot so that he gets his next fucking check and i'm not going to get into all that but that's not an isolated case um, no it's, it's not i mean 70 percent of the navajo students that come into my doctoral program are saying the same thing there and they're saying that the 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 for example uh just uh, last month one of my students was was totally upset and wanted to write a, a rebuttal letter the chief of the navajo nation uh took people to israel to learn how to do sh sheep farming he says why aren't they going to elders who have been doing this for hundreds of years right here on the reservation? So this is what you're saying. So, but um, I wanted to, to just introduce you to uh, Jürgen uh, Kaiser, who is from Colombia. And uh, Jürgen came to me here in Mexico uh, and wanted to learn about the Lakota way and wanted to do, uh, uh, and he started with a vision quest and he's been doing ceremony with me for what, four three or four years now, but I just said, would you be willing to just uh, say what it was about what you learned from indigenous worldview and how it has transformed you or how it's helped you? So here, this is uh, Jurgen. It's all yours, Jurgen. Thank you for Arios. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Darcia. It's a pleasure to share just a little insight on the uh, amazing opportunity that I've had uh, of running into Cuatro Flechas here in Mexico and really uh, long story short, the uh, indigenous worldview has allowed me to have uh, to get much more in sync with nature, to be able to uh, shift my perspective of of the kind of traditional education that I had received along my life, uh, and it really has been an eye opening experience and a very a uh, positive revelation. Obviously, being able not only to get let's say like the theoretical aspect of the indigenous worldview, but actually practicing and living close to nature and having that uh, a opportunity of validating these statements. And um, obviously, uh, in my engagement with Cuatro Frechas has also come with a lot of reading, a lot of study. I recently had the opportunity of uh, finishing the book that uh, they wrote uh, together with Darsha, which is this uh, dialogue on those uh, principles from the indigenous worldview versus that dominant worldview. And I think that's probably one amazing tool that uh, both Darcia and Cuatro are kind of putting out there in the world because it really brings down uh, in a very like pragmatic and a very accessible way how indigenous worldview is not something uh, external, it's something that it la it's within us, you know, and it's really a matter of reconnecting with the ability to observe and to contemplate and to uh, accept the spirit and the mysterious. So um, I can only say it's been it's been a life changing experience and I and I'm committed to try to expand this knowledge and to allow people to be able to have access to this information because I think it's, it's a technology. It's a technology that allows you to live a much more fulfilled life. It's a technology that allows you to live a much more sustainable life, a much more meaningful, purposeful life. So I can only say uh, to whomever is out there that has still kind of any doubt, I'd say give it a try because it really is a life-changing experience. I like that he used the word technology because uh, Dr. Michael Fisher has written about uh, about this work, and he calls it a dehypnotizing technology, which really plays into what Darren was saying. You know that, that even our our own people have been hypnotized by the brutality, by the the materialism, by the loss of ceremony, and 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 and, he, and Michael Fisher he says that that the work that Darsh and I did in this book is a is a dehypnotizing technology. So I'm glad he mentioned that word. Yeah, yeah, that was well said. Thank you for sharing that. That was great. Yeah, thanks. So you're, are you a Lakota then? 
I am a made relative of the Lakota. It was one of the seven sacred ceremonies. And, um, and so my uh, Rick Two Dog says that I'm not going to go to where my Irish uh, ancestors or my Cherokee ancestors go. That that because uh, well, once you are relative uh, of the Lakota, you're it, it's, it's you're part of that extended family. And so that's how I feel. I'm a, I, I, my my spiritual tradition and uh, is, as a pipe carrier is is what is you know what guides me. But it's those uh, uh, those common denominators with the Ojibwe and with the, 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 the Shalagi and with the Raramuri and with the, you know, all the different, the, the Hukakogi where, uh, you know, he, he comes from. So, um, I think the Cherokee were part of the Anishinaabe, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, um, Lakota, I mean, is the Lakota, what's the, what's the knowledge retention from the Lakota tribe to the Cherokee tribe? To the you know because it seems like in some ways all the best books that I found are about the Lakota. You know you've got Sitting Bull, you've got the Black Elk stuff. Um, you know the Crazy Bull, you've got that from a bunch of different people. But I mean the Black Elk stuff seems to really be good because he was kind of recounting his life when he was kind of born around then. And I really haven't been able to find a lot of like I've looked for some Ojibwe stuff and it's it's really pretty scattered. It, it's super scattered especially from that autobiographical biographical sort of standpoint. So I'm wondering, uh, yeah, I think that, that that's really kind of a, uh, a, an indication that the Lakota were amongst the last to, to really give up the fight uh, that, that, and, and, and that when reporters in the 1880s were starting to, to, to interview people. We started to learn about fool's crow and all of these people. So I, I think it's just sort of a coincidence. I think the same wisdom we can find in, 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 in every culture around the world. And this is what and I've done. I've lived with many uh, that are, that have not lost it. Um, but, uh, but you're right uh, that, that the Lakota really, you know, that so when I was uh, people from all over the world would come to Pine Ridge you know, where the, the average lifespan of a male is only 43 and the poverty, you know, I mean, the, uh, the unemployment is 75%. It was horrible. And yet they would go there. Oh, I want to see a, a Lakota person. Right. I mean, so you're right. There is that. Uh, and, you know, I think it hurts us as much as it, as it helps us, but it's, there's, it doesn't mean that there are more, there's more wisdom in, and it. it's just that we've had more opportunity because of that sort of publicity uh, that is that has come about. So, I was uh, I was mistaken that it was uh, I was thinking of maybe the the Algonquin, but it wasn't the Cherokee. <clears throat> yeah. So, can you recommend any resources? Do you, like uh, some books or anything like that about some of the different cultures that where people can can find can find these and read them. So our our quotes are from people who have uh, have writings. So Robin Wall Kimmerer, for example, writing Sweet Grass, that's an excellent book. A lot of people find that intriguing, especially the Euro Americans and Euro uh, background people. It's a way for them to enter into this uh, broader relational orientation. To uh, she's a botanist, so it's with plants in particular. And yeah, there are other people. Uh, I was just pulling out a book today um, by Stephen Sachs. He has a series of um, honoring the circle. And if I could find and also, it. if you look at the, the endorsements of our of our book, you'll see a, a number of indigenous scholars. Yeah, that's a good one. There's a lot. There's a lot of them. Um, we're on the bottom of the hour now, and uh, I have I've got something that's going to be coming up. So yeah, no I, problem. Where can yeah. we find your book? Uh, well, it's at Amazon, and uh, it's a Penguin uh, distributed book, and there's an audio book now. So with us uh, doing it and uh, four hours grandson. How was the Excellent. audiobook experience? Yeah, where can people, yeah, good, yeah. what's the website uh, where people can find all this stuff? Is there any social media? Is there anything like that? Yeah, can you put the links down below your podcast? Yeah, yeah we'll, have, we'll, put, we'll put we'll all put the put links in the notes. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of people don't check the notes, so it's always a good idea to say them all too. Oh, well, 
Yes. Kindredmedia.org will have a lot of information. Uh, EvolveMess.org also. Okay. FourArrowsBooks.com. And um, yeah, those are probably the best. Yeah, and I think if you just go to Google and put Indigenous Worldview, Four Arrows, Garcia, you'll get 18 pages. So there's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Thanks a lot for uh, coming All on. Right. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Take care. See ya. Bye. And that was a chat with Darsha and Four Arrows. What do you think, buddy? Yeah, I, yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah. I I wanted to avoid any sort of super controversial stuff. Really, I didn't want to get into into that. Yeah. You know? um, you can't there's help some it. stuff. You know, there's some stuff about uh, other things in the book that I don't really necessarily agree with. Like I was. You know, I had some notes just in case we were going to get into like how how colonialization stopped before cli or climate ch how climate change isn't a part of that right now. Like I still I consider that connected, you know, but I didn't want to dig deep into that. But there's some stuff in there. The that, climate uh, change agenda. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah some of the gender fluid <laughs> stuff as well. And I'm like, but don't aren't they kind of like. That whole movement. Well, to me, the gender fluid be... thing is a different thing because it's not about cutting anyone's dick off. You're just accepting them as they are instead of yeah, saying exactly, that they have exactly. to be fucking that's the way I tried to really. Yeah, that's the way I tried that's to That's a take very it. different thing. But there was a bit in there about the, you know, the, the two spirit and the stuff like that, which is fine. Like, yeah, that's all that's totally a, cool. You, two spirits are yeah. an age old thing. But like I said, nobody was getting their dick cut off. Yeah. Our right, blockers. that's a good point. That's so, a very okay, different thing. So, anyway, I yeah, shouldn't even yeah, say yeah. that at the end of this episode. It's the last thing we need to get into. But anyway, know, but maybe, you yeah. brought it up because you're a fuck. Anyways, anyway, it's a good, it's a, it's, it's uh, I, I like the precepts and I, you know, I don't know. I like the more, the more sort of animistic uh, view of the universe. It reminded me somewhat of Gordon White's books uh, as well. Like, you know, I wanted to ask them if they're connected with other, other indigenous uh, cultures around the world like if this is a bigger movement than just sort of the states but yeah you know, i to check to that out about the states too like um well i'm not as i don't know much about the states i don't know much about much you, mean, well, what do you mean you wrote about the canadian stuff and there was a difference between the way it was handled like we were worse off from an indigenous point of view still because the states had given them more rights than than we well got. they got they got to be citizens first but we got that later but the main thing is they got the land but I don't know the ins and outs of it oh, enough okay, to start okay. arguing yeah, yeah, yeah. policy yeah, okay, or the okay, money yeah, or what the yeah, yeah, assimilation yeah. programs are like there. I I can tell you this. Every fucking reser reservation we've driven through yeah. has not been fucking pretty. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking. And it has that, never yeah. been in a very hospitable it's, no. fucking spot. Yeah. That's you know what point, I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of shitty. I mean, you look at even Susini here in Calgary. If they weren't up against Calgary, they're not like, you know, it's dry as fuck. It's not a great spot. But they just happen to be up against the city so they can make some money. Where so. Are they literally up against the city? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, are they, which, part of, which like, side? the Grey Eagle Casino is on the res reservation. Oh, is it? Right there? Oh, I, the, on that side. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, it's beautiful. Right to it's the, beautiful. The right to the east? But there's like, I don't think they even got a fucking river going through that shit. You know? Oh yeah, they do. They have the whole the, that whole uh, reservoir there. The Glenmore Re Reservoir is on that. The Glenmore Reservoir. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah, it borders on the, the reserve. Well, it borders on it. What fills that up, though? Isn't that fed There's off from the bow? There must be, right? Yeah. I, I think know. it's filtered off of the bow. Yeah. But it's a, it's your points is still valid. I mean, it's yeah. My points are always valid. Yeah. Anyway, um, what's on the what's on the east co east side of Calgary? There's another reserve out there on the east. On is the that, east side, well, there's the yeah. Blackfoot. The Blackfoot Nation is down. It's in the the one where you start heading towards Vulcan, there's a cool ravine there, and it's on a reserve. Yeah, I think that's all. It's probably all black Blackfoot. Foot. Yeah. I think that's all the Blackfoot one. And then there's like there's a Stony one, and there's the Eden Valley one. There's a bunch. They're all over. Stony. I, I mean, I don't know how many are in Alberta, but there's over six hundred in Canada. So wow, wow, yeah, yeah. Hey, big thanks to Darsha and Foros for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks for one of our supporters. We can't do this without support. We just can't. Uh, if you guys are getting some value from our five hundred and sixty some episodes we put out, all for free, all in the back catalog, no paywall. 
For America.ca slash support, make a one-time donation, sign up for a monthly today. Head over to grimeamerica.ca if you want to check out links to our other podcasts, the events that we do with great people like Randall Carlson, and we'll be selling the Eclipse event soon. We've got a bunch of cool stuff coming up on that front. The audiobooks are there. You can get to everything there, including my two books on the Indigenous situation in Canada. Uh, there's a link there that says Darren Books. Click on that. You can get to A Canadian Shame and In Their Own Words. Uh, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Choosing the way